All right, my special guest is Dave Som. Dave has been a great contributor to this show. Dave, you've probably called in 50 voicemails at least over the years. Probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, and they're all good. I mean, they're all really good questions, good comments. So finally, I got you here live and in person, and uh, it's good to see you. It's good to see you too, Bob. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. So I brought you on because my goal is uh, to talk about what do you carry and why. And here on the Handgun World podcast, that's what I've been focusing on the last two or three weeks. And I contend, I intend to continue to focus on that for quite some time. And I really enjoy meeting listeners, talking to listeners. So, Dave. What do you carry and why? Well, right now I carry a Smith & Wesson M&P uh, 2.0 compact. It's kind of a mouthful, but it's the, the newer version of the M&P in about the Glock 19 size, the four inch That's barrel. That's right, yeah. And uh, it has, I have a Trigicon HD XR uh, night sights on it. Nice. Yes. And uh, that's the gun. So why do I carry that one? So, yeah, why do you carry that? <clears throat> So a long time ago, when I first started carrying, I, uh, I picked out a SIG 229, and I liked it. I liked the way it fit in my hand. I couldn't tell you why, but I liked that it had a hammer. You know, I, I didn't know a lot, but I looked at the Glocks, and I was like, I don't know. I, I like having a hammer. I don't know why. But um, So I learned how to shoot on that gun, and I had gone through various different training classes, um, you know, with Masada Yub. Um, a few other people with that gun and then um, and I but then at some point I got a job working at Loomis the armored car company and they had a thing where they will do a loan for 600 bucks um, that you can use to buy a gun and then really you just pay, you just pay it back like 10 bucks out of every paycheck so it's basically wow, a free gun cool. so that's pretty cool and um, I noticed that my my SIG that I was carrying on a duty belt, it was kind of getting knocked around on stuff. And it's it, not that that should matter because it's a tool, but you know, it's the first gun I ever bought. It I have a little bit of sentimental value. So I ended up getting an M and P um, pro. And so this is the gen one M and P's and I would shoot that for qualifications. Um, and I got pretty, pretty good with that. And, uh, and I would notice that when I would go and shoot the the qualifications for the armored car license, yeah, uh, I would I would do well there. And then when I would get my SIG out, my concealed carry gun, for practice, I noticed that it kind of would jump a lot more than I was expecting it to. The SIG and, did. The yeah. SIG jumped more. Okay. Yeah, which is weird because it it didn't feel like it was it was you know snappy before I before I was shooting the M&P. So I found that if I could just clench on it harder, then that seemed to solve the problem. But that that should have been a little bit of a clue that maybe maybe that the grip on that gun or maybe something about that gun was maybe not optimal. Um, so fast forward to a couple of years ago, there's a training uh, group of instructors called primary and secondary that are actually based out of Northern Utah. Yeah. And they put on a training summit where you get a chance to take a, you know, instruction blocks with numerous different instructors. And that was a wonderful opportunity. I was able to go to that. One of the classes is taught by a guy named Chuck Pressburg. And his, his kind of claim to fame is he wants to, to be as accurate as humanly possible. And so when we went to the class, we sighted in our guns. A lot of people had red dots. And so we were sighting them in at 15 yards. Yeah. And then we started doing, you know, mock qualification shots. It would be like you have three and a half seconds to draw from the holster and get three shots in the black area of a B8 repair center, which is about a five inch circle. Um, it like 20 yards and then at 25 yards. So we like three and a half seconds. So that's and how did you do? I I could not get a group. 
with, with what, my SIG? SIG? With my SIG. And it was like, ah, it was, it was freaking me out. I was very frustrated. And at some point, Chuck talk, you know, had a little talk with me after the class. And he said, listen, you know, whatever sentimentality you have, some guns are easier to shoot. For and some people. For some people. And I was like, hmm, I thought about that. And then the next day, to cap off the training summit, we did a little kind of mini um, IPSC shooting challenge. And I used my M&P Pro for that, and it was just easier. And I was like, hmm, if I'm going to be honest, if yeah. the goal is to hit the target, then maybe I need to maybe I need to reconsider this egg at least for a little while. Yeah, and those M&Ps are such sweet shooters, aren't they? Oh yeah, it's it's. I, when I learned how to shoot with the SIG, we would do the, um, you know, you'd pin the trigger and then do a reset. Yeah. And now the, the, the thinking is kind of shifting away from that. But I noticed with the M&P, the reset, even the M&P Pro with the allegedly bad, you know, reset on the, the old yeah. MPs, you just, you relax your trigger finger and then it's reset. And then you just, so instead of going bang, reset, bang, reset, you just go bang, 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 bang. And, you know, and we're not saying that SIGs are bad guns. SIGs are fantastic guns. And some people, um, civilians, law enforcement, even some military, they're able to make those SIGs work very well. And some people can't. Oh, yeah. And mm. I and I have I, I have plans to get one of the E2 grips for the SIG where they're mm -hmm. they're kind of shrunken down, kind of like a grip reduction. Um, and I want to put that on my gun and see if that makes it easier, because I noticed with the. Uh, you know, the bigger grip on the SIG, I feel like my hand is kind of stretched out a little to reach out. Yeah, yeah. Get that, and then on the m &P, it's a lot more, um, yeah. you know. Well, what you're talking about is you're talking about the circumference of the grip. Yeah. The circumference of the grip on a SIG is usually a lot more than an m &P or a Glock or a lot of the modern striker fired. Now, I'll, I'll qualify that by saying, the fifth generation Glocks seem to fit people's hands much more than the older third gens. But I once had a SIG 229. Uh, I had the Legion. And I kind of regret selling it, but kind of don't. I was able to do pretty well with that. But I did notice no matter what I did, no matter how hard my grip was on that gun, no matter where I put my hands or put my fingers, I still had more muzzle rise with the SIG than I did with M&P or Glock or anything else that I had. Yeah, and and I think there are definite advantages of those old SIG guns, like having the hammer. When you go back into the holster, you can the cover hammer's it up. nice. The hammer's so, nice. So you so you're not going to accidentally shoot yourself. And yeah. I've heard I've heard people talk about you know in police situations they. They have their double action and they, they go to aim and they start to squeeze and then the guy gives up. And so they're like, okay. And if they had had a short single action trigger, they might have broke a shot. So there's, there's some advantages to yeah. that. Yes. But yes, for right now, are. but for right now, the, uh, the M and P seems, seems to work pretty well. Good. Um, and, uh, uh, the reasons I like it. So again, if I'm being honest, I could probably get by with like a shield. You know, even the older shields with like eight shots, but mm -hmm. the M&P Compact, it's kind of the full size. It has that 15 round magazine and it, you know, it is a bit of a security blanket. I feel better having more ammo on hand. Um, but it, the way that it, it fits my hand, it's not too big. It's not too small. Gives me a pretty stable platform to shoot from. And then I don't have a red dot on mine yet. So the, yeah. the longer sight radius that's you know, from that four inch barrel, it does help to be more precise at longer distances. Which grip panel do you have on your M and P compact? I think I put the smallest one on there. Yeah, okay. And that's what's beautiful about guns like that is compared to the SIG two twenty nine, you couldn't do that. The grip was the grip. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the old Glocks were that way too. The grip is the grip. You weren't gonna unless you unless you modified the actual grip, you weren't gonna do much with it. Yeah. Yeah. So and and with some of the other the other trainings I've taken, um, like at, at one time I wanted to be a police officer. I went through yeah 
police academy training and we got to do stuff like simunitions training uh running around in the school you know practicing reacting to an active shooter that type of thing and i learned that um a lot of the things that are important in situations like that is like movement and cover and seeing somebody evaluating um so like the shooting problem is like doing the actual shooting is not very complicated and so having a gun that that makes it as easy as possible where there's less i don't know friction as far as getting the shot broken correctly that that helps because there's so many other decisions that you're going to be constantly making and that's and you find that the m p works better for that huh uh it seems for to you be. for yeah, you for me i um you know with that uh that that um hd site as i bring it out you can you can start to track the site when you're about halfway extended when you get it out there the trigger like it's not a 1911 perfect trigger but like you just you take the slack off and then pop and it, and it yeah well i'll say this the 2.0 version of the mps the trigger on those far better than the original mps would you agree i think so uh, but my original m and pre m and p came from like the smith and wesson pro shop so it actually had a pretty decent oh okay trigger that's <laughs> right you had the pro model i forgot that you said that yeah. You got the pro model. Um, and I've, as I've said for years, after 1,000 to 2,000 rounds, most triggers and shooters get better Oh yeah, at that, at that round count. So uh, what I like about the M&P 2.0 is I like their grip. I like the texture of that grip. Some people think it's kind of aggressive. For me, it, it seems to help me lock that pistol in place better which therefore assists in a little bit better accuracy. And it doesn't, it doesn't shift around in your hands as much. You know, nope. you get it in there, it's, it's in. Um, with mine, the grip was a little, a little too much. Where, it was, where I was doing it concealed carry, it seemed like the grip was, was grabbing onto bits of, you know, a shirt. Yeah, and, uh, that's you know, one that could, problem, yes. So so what I did is I just I just took some sandpaper and just kind of smoothed you know, a it couple off. passes. It's still yeah. it's still rough, but it's not as uh, not it's as rough sharp. enough. Yeah, it's rough enough. You you, yeah. you grab it. It's not smooth. The original M and P's were they had really smooth grips. Oh, it's like grabbing onto a, a garden hose or something like that. Yeah, you know, really slick. Huh? Grabbing onto a wet hose was it was an M and P. Yeah. I mean, and you can you can deal with it, but I I found an old uh, soldering iron uh, yeah. at one point, and so I got my the older M and P out and just kind of kind of roughed it up a little bit, so it's a little more um, you know, textured. Yeah. So, how many rounds do you got through your compact that you carry? Um, I've probably got well, probably a few hundred, I'd say. I don't get to shoot as much as I would like. I don't think anybody does, but no. um, enough that it's it seems to run, um, and it's I haven't you know wouldn't anticipate any problems with an M and P. I don't know if I have quite a thousand yet through it, but kind of I'm working up to that. Okay, what ammo do you carry? The ammo that I carry is usually well, it's what I can find, and it's usually either. Um, Gold dots or yeah. HST? What you can find yeah, and what's in your budget, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but I like um, I like the 124 grain gold dots or the 124 grain HST. Yeah. But I noticed on this, on this, the way the sights are set up on this, it seems to be kind of when you get further away, it seems to be kind of a six o'clock hold. So, I wonder if I changed bullet weight, if it might change where the impact of the bullet is. So you might want of, to try the 147s and see how that works. Yeah, and there's a there's an argument that like the bigger, heavier bullet is going to have better momentum going through. Something well, anyway, buy a box of 147 grain and buy a box of 115 grain, yeah. and and compare the point of aim, point of impact at certain distances, and you'll find the one that that works the best. Yeah, um, I've kind of noticed that with the Trigicon sights now. I've got the Trigicon HDs, but I don't have the XR version like you. I have the older version, and I really like those. For iron sights, 
I think they're well worth the money. Some of the best iron sights you can buy. Oh yeah, they're they're really easy to pick up. The just for people who don't know, the XR the front post is actually skinnier. Yes. And so you can you can see light on either side, and so as you're bringing it up, um, you know you can kind of catch the when you're kind of halfway extended, you can catch that front sight, and then just like drop it right down into the to the rear sight, right as you come to full extension. Is and, your rear sight a U notch? Yeah. Yeah, it's a U notch. It's so it's not like it's not a red dot, but I kind of feel like I'm looking through a window at the front sight. So it kind of feels like a red dot. And then when you're when you're a close range, I found within like five yards or closer in, you know, you can just put the dot on the target and that's about where the bullet will hit. It's when you really have to aim is about at seven yards. From my experience. And you you mentioned something earlier about six o'clock hold for the people. For the people who are kind of new at carrying and shooting, explain to them what a six o'clock hold is. Okay, so a six o'clock hold, imagine the bullseye on a target and imagine it's like a clock. So yeah. we want to put a six o'clock hold means we will put the, we line up the top or the front and the rear sights and we're going to put them right about six o'clock on the Right target, here at six o'clock. And then the bullet would impact right in the middle. And so I've noticed that... Uh, when I get out to seven yards or further away to hit like a B8 bullseye, I would have to aim fairly low with the front sight. I was still able to to get it in the middle, but um, it's just something you have to pay attention to when you when you are shooting your guns. You know, you need to, we're not just we're not just throwing bullets out there. We have to put them right where they're going to be most effective. You're a hundred percent correct. Now this is where an optic comes into being a, a big advantage. All that stuff goes away. Put the red as long as it's zeroed properly, yep. put the dot on the target, smoothly press the trigger, and that's where the bullet goes. Yep. I uh I need to get I'll I'll get one someday, I'm sure. <laughs> I had one three years ago. I moved away from it. Uh and probably in two weeks I'll be buying another optic putting it back on one of my carry guns. And if all goes well, they'll all have optics on them. Yeah, that's uh, that's an advantage of the optics is they're, they allow, again, it's one of those things, you're taking away friction in the, the shooting process where yeah. you can just put the dot on. Another advantage of the optic, so on my, my Pro, I have like that four inch barrel, the slide's a little bit longer, it gives me a good sight radius. Well, on an optic, like sight radius is like doesn't matter it doesn't matter it's it's you know from the emitter to the glass that's the sight radius that's it you're right <laughs> it doesn't matter if you have it on a you know a glock 34 or a glock, or a 26 yeah yeah or, or even on an mmp shield um if you got a good optic on that right sight radius is far less of a factor yeah and it's consistent and you can you can dial it in exactly where you need to and put those shots very precisely and the price of optics these days, certain optics, uh, optics. I mean, somebody recommended that I look into uh, one of the Holison optics, uh, the green dot versions. And, you know, it's like three hundred and thirty nine dollars. It's it's that's nothing really. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it back in the day when when optics were just starting to become popular, you know, you might pay seven or eight hundred. Now there's so many options for less than three hundred and fifty dollars, it makes sense. Oh yeah, and they, I mean, as long as they work, they work. And one thing about the optic that is an advantage is, if you put on your, if you put on new iron sights, mm -hmm. and they're not exactly lined up properly, then, you know, unless you have a vice and a hammer and a punch, then you're going to be shooting left or right for the rest of the day. But with an optic, if it's if it's a little bit off, you can just you adjust it, tweak it right there. Yeah, you adjust it and tweak it. All right, so the M&P Compact, that's your primary carry gun. Um, I suppose I should also ask, what's your holster and your belt setup? Okay, so my belt, it's a Wilderness Tactical um, instructor belt, and it's the... Five-stitch? It's the five-stitch, yeah. I so just ordered little... a new one. Nice, yeah, I'm... I'm trying to decide if I want to, because I think the Velcro is wearing out on mine. I've had it for a few years. Um, I've had so mine I, about seven years. Mine, yeah. mine wore out. 
Yeah, I'm I'm trying to decide if I want to get the one with the. I guess that there's one that has a plastic liner inside, so it's more more rigid. Yeah, I've noticed that. Uh, well, I can still conceal. I've noticed sometimes the belt wants to kind of like bend out a little bit, but it's not a huge problem. And and where I live, I'm not going to. You know, people aren't going to be calling the cops on me if they see a lump under my shirt. Like we're in northern Utah. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, I'm in southern Texas, and really Texans are pretty pretty tolerant if they happen to notice that you have a gun you know uh, a couple months ago i stopped at a gas station to fill up my truck and i saw a guy double open carrying <laughs> i didn't say anything well nobody said anything i all i said to him was hey those are pretty cool i like those nice. you know and that's kind of the way texans are too so would that, instead of the New York reload, would that be the, the South Texas reload? He had, he had um, a large Glock, either something like a, a Glock 17 or a 23, maybe even a 34, on the right hip. And he had a revolver of some kind, carried cross draw, or, yeah, I guess you could call it cross draw, on his left hip. That's the way he was walking around. And he was open carrying both. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So so I've got the, the Wilderness Tactical. I have the um, 1.75 inch. So it's yeah. extra wide. We got and, the inch and three quarter. Yeah, inch and three quarter. I found that when I was um, I was carrying my SIG in a um, concealment solutions Cobra, the outside the waistband holster. And I found having that having that wider belt added a lot more stability, and it kind of oh, yeah. kept it kept it snugged in. So, um, I'm, and I'm like six foot three. So, yep, here you go. Just to uh, to take care of Jason, my sponsor at at Concealment Solutions, one of my sponsors. Um, this is his uh, Cobra straight drop that I carry my uh, Glock 43X in it. So yeah. that's what you're using. You're using the Cobra outside the waistband. Um, that's what I was using for when I was carrying my Sig. Um, yeah. A lot of times when I would be when I'd be on the road, um, I would have that. With the M and P, there's a um, someone that I knew from some internet gun forums that started making holsters. A company called Privateer Leather. So I have a nice leather holster for my cool. for my M and P. So good and. and I, I carried in um, one of Jason Christensen's the hybrid holsters, the uh, formerly known as the Mamba, but not the known Mamba. as that anymore. <laughs> but um, and I carried in one of those for a long time, and those are those are work great. And even times when I need to be like have a shirt tucked in, I'll pull out the the concealment solutions. But this uh, I think it's the Buccaneer um, from Privateer Leather. It's very comfortable. And okay. It, and it and it holds onto the gun really well, and it's uh, and it's and it it doesn't bulge out too much. Even though it is leather, it's probably a little thicker than like a Kydex holster. But it Good. Doesn't, it doesn't seem to affect concealment. Well, that's that's the most important thing right there is that you can conceal it. Yeah. And so the last carry question: uh, How do you carry your spare magazine, or do you? I I carry a spare magazine. And it's, uh, I had read early on in my gun carrying career that you've gone through all the trouble to carry a gun, you might as well carry an extra magazine. It's, it's not that much more effort. And um, in training, in competitions, I've had double feeds with my SIG and the M&P Pro. So I've, I've actually had situations that apparently, you know, if, depending on who you ask, like those never happen, but I've had double feeds where you have to get that magazine out and clear me it, too. put a new one in. So to me, it's like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't cost that much. And then I use uh, the mag holder magazines. And it's just so do I. right up next to the belt buckle. Yeah. And it does, it's not bigger than your belt. It just nope. is there. It's ready you to carry, go. So you carry your extra magazine horizontal like I do. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, for a while, I had some of Jason's, um, I think they're the Venom mag carriers where they're mm -hmm. vertical. Mm -hmm. And those were fine, but you feel them on your side sometimes. They kind of poke a little bit. 
Yeah. And just the uh, just that horizontal one, just right up there on the front. It's just kind of out of the way. And if you're not, you know, skinny as a rail, it's it's you know, if you have a little bit of a stomach, it's it's hidden. It's gone. You can't see it at all. And the mag holders are great. I think Mark Housekeeper started that, right? Yeah. 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 Mark Housekeeper. I was uh, my uh, first well, my the mag 40 class I went in. Mark was there and he he oh. had uh, I think he was shooting a Kimber, some kind of 1911. So, yeah, he brought those in and those are it's a good product. They have yeah. the newer the newer ones now where they instead of just the tension of the plastic, they have that little clip in there and it just your magazine just snaps right in there. Mm -hmm. And um, with the new the newer clips that are separated out instead of that mono block. Like yeah. When I when I'm changing belts, it it takes quite a bit of finagling to get that off. Yeah. So it's, it's not you don't have to worry about like oh, is it going to slip off randomly during the day? Like, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's really cool is, you know, magholder.com, you can get those. You can also get them at concealmentsolutions.com. Uh, and I, I just think I love, the, I love that method of carrying an extra uh, magazine horizontal because it just seems, it seems to make sense. And it's so much more comfortable and concealable. You mentioned earlier, if you're going to go through the tra trouble of carrying a gun, well, I'll take that a step further. If you're going to go through the trouble to conceal a gun, you might as, might as well carry your extra magazine in the most concealed and efficient manner as well, right? Yeah, and I think a lot of people, when they don't conceal, uh, when they don't carry a magazine, I think a lot of it is like comfort. It's, uh, you know, for whatever reason, stuffing it in their pants, it, you know, having, having two... For me, I've tried having... You know the gun and the magazine inside the waistband and it yeah. seems like there's not a lot of belt contacting my body and it's not yeah. so i think people might get frustrated with that um it, it, you know a lot of people don't want to change the way they dress too much when they're carrying no. a gun and no and that's you know that's fine but the genius of the the mag holder is that it's just it's just there and you don't think about it it's not any bigger than your belt so, I mean, and I've actually noticed, Dave, for me, it's a little faster to get that magazine out because I carry that horizontal. Um, I use that mag holder horizontal carrier at about, let's see, you were talking about a clock. So I put it on my left side. That would be about 10, 10 to 1030 on the clock position. And I can get the magazine out faster that way than I can reach him back on my hip what about you yeah i mean it's it's pretty fast um having it on my hip it's uh it's easy to get out but it's the, the easiest way to do that on your hip is if you have like a duty belt safari yeah. safari land makes these cool mag holders where the the bullet tips actually face straight out from your body so it, mm -hmm. i don't know it seems more ergonomic but um as far as carrying concealed it's just, you know, we a lot of people have proven with appendix carry that being able to get to stuff that's in the front is a little bit faster. You know, it's, you have to go to here instead of having to go back. And so being able to just pop the shirt and just strip that mag out. Exactly. Then it's ready to go. You can just pop it in your gun and do what you need to do. Or if you're, you know, you're having to clear a malfunction you let that magazine drop and you can just stick that new one in there really quick again absolutely make it easy for yourself yeah you mentioned one one last thing i want to mention um a, little, a few minutes ago you talked about you had a double feed and you've had double feeds in in the guns you know so often i either see on the internet or i hear people say my guns never malfunctioned and to that i would say if you have a gun, any gun, even a revolver, less likely with a revolver, but if you have a gun, a semi-automatic gun that is not malfunctioned, you probably need to shoot it more. Yeah, I would say so. If you, I mean, it's it's a machine, it has moving parts, right? And yeah. there's there's friction points on. Uh, I had a couple of double feeds on my on my Sig, and I was kind of puzzling over it, and then I realized. I can't remember the last time I had cleaned under the extractor hook. Oh, okay. That's the case. So I got a you know toothbrush and cleaned that out. It seemed to seem to help. It could also be 
that the spring that's putting tension on that extractor could be could be worn out and needs could to be, be replaced. Weak. Right. Like, things things happen, and I've heard uh, you know very experienced policemen like Chuck Haggard, Daryl Bolke, they talk about how semi-automatics in real-world shootings where maybe you don't have the ideal stance always, Mm -hmm. they malfunction more than you would think that they would. That is correct. That is correct. And uh, I think it's, like, again, it doesn't cost anything to have an extra mag. And uh, some of the you know, the malfunction clearance that I learned at the police academy that seems to be pretty reliable for my guns was wow. you, you know, you get your double feed, you do the tap rack just as a reflex because maybe that'll fix it. Once you realize the double feed, you hold down the mag release and then just run, run the slide, you know, three times. That should let the magazine go throughout the bullets and then you would need to put a new magazine in there. And a malfunction I've, clearing is is the most often reason that you need an extra magazine. Yeah. And I've, I've heard some people say that all you need to do, you know, if it's a malfunction, you can just pull the magazine out and that'll load the round that's in there. Then you can put it back in and it's like, maybe. But maybe. I, I would worry that when you pull it out to let that extra round drop out, what if you don't do it enough? And then you've got an extra round inside the magazine. Well, shoved up there and then your magazine falls out it, like just get rid of the mag and put another one in get rid of the mag it's like it's maybe it's not as fast necessarily but it's reliable and like getting the gun back in the fight if you need to like your day has gone really really bad it's if you're on bad anyway has you it? have to reload but you know getting yeah. that back in there is like what you have to do so do yeah that's great possible well dave thank you very much Thank this you. has been this has been great. I'm glad to finally, after all these years, have you on the show. Oh yeah, and it's uh, it's great. I want to do this again and uh, reach out to me if if you change up what you carry because the viewers and listeners might want to know if you make some changes in some things. Sure, I have some plans for the future to okay. get a. Um, for a while, I had a car CM9 that I was carrying as a little pocket gun. Yeah. And I also got it because it's a lower capacity and sometimes my job would take me into California. I wouldn't be concealed carrying in California, but I would want to conceal carry to and from. And I can't bring, you know, 13 to 15 round magazines in, which is is dumb, but I don't want to be the test case. Right. 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 You don't want to do that. I had that as a little pocket gun um, and I sold it to my brother and he he was small enough now that he can he carries it. He was carrying a one of those M and P nine C's. Mm-hmm. So not the compact, but the original, the one that's bigger than a twenty six, but smaller than a Glock nine. Yeah, the original M and P nine C. Yeah, and it's and he felt that was a little thick for him. The little car was a little more convenient. But I was thinking about getting another pocket gun, getting like a Smith and Wesson six forty two. Yes, those are nice. And uh, there's some there's some good arguments for having a revolver in your pocket um, as far oh, as yes. street encounters. You know, you can have a really fast draw if you've already got the firing grip on and you can just, you know, pop it out. And I'd like to make a recommendation. Um, if you're going to get a Smith & Wesson 642, pay just a little extra money and get the Performance Center model. Yeah. Okay. The trigger is outstanding on it. it. And it also looks cool, but one of the big criticisms of J-frame revolvers is that they got horrible triggers. Yeah. Not the Smith & Wesson 642 Performance Center. It's got a beautiful... And I Smith & Wesson doesn't sponsor me. They didn't pay me to say this. Yeah. I just own one, and it's a great trigger. Okay, well, I will keep that in mind. And Just keep it in mind. Compare, yeah. uh, price shop them. You'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. So <coughs> that might be a thing in the future. And yeah. See if I can figure out doing pocket carry a little bit more. The time when I would pocket carry that CM9, like, man, it's convenient. It is so... Oh yeah, it's so easy to just drop that it, thing in your pocket. And it's no harder to carry the 642 revolver than it is the the CM9. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, and you're right. You're right about the uh, revolvers. There's a there's a time, a place, and a use for those. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, someone like Daryl Bolke, that, that you may shoot out and, like, your limit is, like, seven yards with one of those. But, like, if you can be a ninja within those seven yards, then it's a very <laughs> viable weapon. <laughs> That's true. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Um, you donated your time, and I appreciate you doing that, okay? Thank you. Okay. I want to close by letting everybody know, please take care of my sponsors, Concealment Solutions. We talked about them today. They make excellent outside the waistband and inside the waistband holsters. They're one of them. Handgun World gives you a 10% discount. And also, for all you appendix carriers out there, the leader in appendix carry, the authorities, our keepers concealment. Spencer Keepers has been on this show many times. Um, I have two of his holsters. You can get a 10% discount using the, the coupon code Handgun World there as well. So, Dave, thanks again. Thank I you. appreciate it. And uh, remember, shoot straight, shoot safe, and read your Bible every day. Will do. Thanks, Dave. Have a great one. All right. You thanks. Too.